A handful of years before World War II, Royal Air Force officer Sir Victor Goddard was flying a biplane from Scotland back to his base in England. What happened next may be the most famous story of what is now called a time slip. A momentary experience or anomaly where someone visits or sees into a different time. See, Victor Goddard thought he saw into the future four or five years for a brief moment while flying over the Drim airfield in Scotland. What he saw, he thinks, can only be explained by time travel. What's intriguing about this phenomenon is that the more we learn about the universe, the more some of the crazier theories about time, time travel, alternate dimensions, alternate realities, etc., etc., all seem to be more valid than they used to. Goddard's time slip and the plethora of other stories from others that have experiences like it may be proof that our understanding of time is just getting started. And Victor Goddard had other paranormal experiences as well. This is a study of strange. Welcome to the show. I'm Michael May. And today, I'm joined by Scott Smith, who's in, actually in the studio. I haven't had someone in the studio in a long time. It's very nice. Was the secretary very nice to you when you came in? Where like, were you taken care of? You got water and... Oh, yeah. The front office people were great. It was nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good. I'm very glad. Um, so you live in Colorado, and I, I've been yeah. preparing this episode, not specifically for you, but you did mention to me that you've heard a, a little bit about this kind of idea of a time slip before. So I thought it might be interesting to to have this story told to you today. Wonderful, yeah. Yeah. What do you know about time slips? Uh, not a ton. I know uh, being in Colorado, you get all the, especially get the Utah stories yeah. uh, coming across Skinwalker and you get a, yeah. a bunch of time slip stuff there and... It depends. Certain guys, it looks like they just look into the distance and they say they can see the future. Some mm -hmm. guys have said they like walk through a portal mm -hmm. and they're in the future kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Now, it's, uh, this topic really fascinates me. And, and it's one that I'm using here at the start of the year on the show. I'm kind of finding some episodes to explore topics that I don't know as well. Like I tend to know more of like the true crime type of stuff. That's mm -hmm. more in my my wheelhouse. But I do have a fascination with time slips. Most like the famous time travel stories out there. Like there's uh, John Tidor, I think is his name. It's like a guy online that's like, I'm from the future. And there's like these interesting stories. But I'm always like, no, bullshit. Whereas like the time slip stories, part of me is like, you know, there's a lot of stuff we don't understand out there. And yeah, you it, get the actual physics of it is pretty yeah, interesting. But absolutely. there's always the what do you call it uh photoshopped oh, yeah, pictures the of yeah. the no the pictures future guy with yeah. a wristwatch from the 40s yeah. or something and most of those i don't believe there's a famous one with i'm totally going on a tangent here but this is fun stuff but there's this famous video that popped up on youtube back when like youtube started of a charlie chaplin movie and a woman walking by with what they say is an iphone and I am a Charlie Chaplin fan. You may not have noticed in my house, but I have a box of Charlie Chaplin yeah. movies out. Multiple box sets, yeah. yes. <laughs> I have seen that movie. I own that movie. It is uh, a hearing aid device. It was basically a cone you put up to your ear to hear, and you see her just scenes later in that movie using it. But people see that one clip on YouTube. It's like, oh, iPhone, time traveler. And it's like, to what end? And why is she? Who's she calling? Yeah, right. Who are you calling <laughs> in like 1918 or whatever? If you're advanced enough to travel through time, I feel like you're going to remember to put away your iPhone yeah, if you're going to yeah. be on camera. Hey, yeah. Exactly. But and yeah, she's still dressed in time appropriate, <laughs> but carrying an iPhone. Anyway, that's not really the point of this episode today, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about a famous time slip story. And this is the first one I think I ever heard. And that's why I wanted to explore it a little bit more. It is very famous, but it is interesting to think about who experienced it. There is a biography behind Sir Victor Goddard who experienced this famous time slip story. Scott, before we do that, I'll do a little bit of biz here just to tell people to please, if you're enjoying the show, subscribe, rate, and review. Check out our Patreon. We're now releasing episodes unedited. And ooh, a plane is flying overhead. 
enjoy that. <laughs> uh, we're releasing episodes unedited no commercials all that kind of good stuff on patreon as well as some other exclusive content so find that information on a study of strange.com you can find a, a way to get there and scott like i said you're from colorado mm-hmm. you worked in the rental car business for a long time yes this is not appropriate for the episode either but do you have any crazy stories of like people leaving weird stuff in oh, their cars? Constantly. I worked in the back end, so on the repair Ooh, side yeah. of it. So I would get the cars either after they had returned from the rental and somebody hit something or they you wreck a car, it ends up at the body shop. I usually mm. got to see all the stuff like when somebody like you get pulled out of your car at short notice. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it runs the gamut of like, oh, this kid's good, gonna be heartbroken. He lost his his blankie. You can tell it's still in the backseat of the car till what was this guy doing? Why this Ooh. this collection of paraphernalia? They don't really match. So yeah, it's and then you get the the, the gruesome stuff sometimes after like a bad accident. You, so it's, it's it runs the gamut. Yeah. Of, Are you allowed to share a story? Uh, maybe when we're done with this episode for for like a quick Patreon drop, like some sort of crazy car story? Are you uh, like absolutely? Oh, oh, nice, nice. <laughs> well, there you go, every ladies and gentlemen, listeners out there, please join our Patreon to listen to some crazy rental car stories <laughs> from Scott later on. That's really exciting. Thank you. Um, okay, so time slips. We've talked a little bit about it already. Uh, just for those that don't know, it is a it's essentially like a paranormal experience that some people claim to have happened to them or seen or heard or believe where you literally like the name says time slip you kind of slip through time for a brief brief moment where there's famous stories of people walking down the street and suddenly they're in the 1950s and they walk into a shop and then it switches back or the the story today is a, a gentleman in a plane who looks down and sees into a different time so he he believes and there are so many of these stories like more than i ever realized most of them are in england which is interesting Mm. and a lot of them are in liverpool which i find really Mm. fascinating liverpool has like a long history of time slips and uh the people that that are staunch believers in time slippage uh say that it typically happens in like ancient areas where there's been like a lot of a lot of stuff has happened there's a lot of energy and things like that it did Special energy getting refracted off of Stonehenge and shooting around. Yeah. Even that's in the same area. I don't know. I've only ever been to the UK to play rugby and and (laughs) it's in and out. (laughs) Yeah. No, I don't think that's near Liverpool, but I could be wrong. Could be wrong about that. So the the man we're going to talk about today, uh, his name is Victor Goddard or, or Sir Victor Goddard. And he's from the UK, from England, and he was a right high-ranking officer in the Royal Air Force. He was a veteran of both world wars. He was obviously knighted, because I said, sir. And I'll get into his biography after I tell, tell the tale of the time slip, um, because who he is is actually a really interesting... It's just interesting to consider that he's the one who experienced this for a variety of reasons, not just because he is a trustworthy veteran and high ranking individual, but also because he has very strong beliefs in the paranormal. So you have to take that into account when you're trying to deduce if this is a real thing or not. And so we're going to dig into him a little bit. So the time slip story, it takes place in 1934. A lot of what I read online said 1935, but in Goddard's own words it is it takes place in 1934 he was a wing commander at the time in the royal air force and he was flying up to edinburgh scotland from a base in andover england and he was only going to be in scotland just like a few days so a little hop do some work go back now while he was in the area he flew over the drim airfield which had been built for use in world war one and I, I think it was built in 1916. It stopped being used as an air, air base after World War I in 1919. And the common tale is that Goddard wanted to check it out because he had spent time there uh, when he was uh, in the army during World War I. And he noticed as he went there <clears throat> that the airfield was no longer in use. The hangars were falling apart. The landing strip was cracked and grass is growing out of it. And the whole area had been turned into a farm. So there were cattle grazing on different sections of the old air base. It's an idyllic English countryside. Oh, that's right. I <laughs> bet it's beautiful, actually. And then he, he sort of saw this. He continued on to his base. And he was flying 
a hawker heart biplane. So a biplane, you know, the double wing thing, but it's also, it's an open cockpit plane. Those are fun. I got to fly in one when I was little. Oh, seriously? Yeah. I've I've always want. I hate flying, but I've always wanted to fly in one of those. I was petrified. I was little. It was a Boy Scouts thing. Oh, and that's my didn't, Boy didn't, Scouts would never have done that. <laughs> didn't want to go, but my my dad was like, "Yeah, you're never going to get this chance again. You're going." Yeah, and yeah. It was fantastic. Do you remember how old you were? Um, I only ever remember ages by what grade. I think I was in third or fourth grade. Okay, I don't so know. maybe eight, nine, something like that. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so yeah, so Goddard, he he flies on to the base in Scotland he's going to stay at. And the very next day, he's flying back to England and he encounters a storm, a really bad storm. And part of why I mentioned that this is a Hawker Hart, which, which is the open cockpit thing, is there's no modern navigation. There's no modern amenities. He's in the open, so when it's raining, he's getting rained on, which is not fun driving through rain at speed, which I've done in cars before. And uh, it gets really treacherous, and he tries to climb to get kind of over the clouds, and he ends up basically spinning out of control as he does that. And uh, the, yeah, the main point, too, about no modern navigation is he uses dead reckoning to navigate, which is basically you see something in the distance you know which kind of direction you're flying and that's how you navigate. So very old school way of, of going about things. Yeah. When you're in one of those, it's just, you're sitting in a tin tub and there's a control stick in front of you and that's about it. And that's it. That's all you have. So I'm going to read a quote here from Goddard of what happened when he encountered this storm and what happened next. In the winter of 1934, I was flying an airplane. It was a Hawker Hart, a mighty fast plane for those days. In fact, It was in a plane of that type. In the following year, I held the Edinburgh to London speed record. In the cloud and fog and heavy rain, I had come spiraling down 8,000 feet, out of control all the way. So I was wondering whether I should plunge into the mountains of Scotland or into the Firth of Forth before I got my heart under control again. My hawker heart was at last under control. My personal heart was not. It was in my throat. I flew straight on, climbing slightly to clear the foreshore. I said to myself, if I go straight on, I'll hit off Drim Airfield. So yeah, he spun out of control through this storm, caught himself, and as he got to like almost near the ground, in some accounts, he's just like 10 feet off the ground when he gets his control of the plane. And the Firth of Forth is actually, it's an estuary, so it's water. It's, you know, Mm -hmm. the end of where rivers and stuff are meeting the sea in Scotland. And he recognizes it. And he wants to head to Drim Airfield. In some accounts I read, he's doing this on purpose because he'll because it's dead reckoning. He'll know where he is and where yeah. he needs to turn and where to go. You said that was a direct quote? Yes, or? that was a direct quote from him God, at some point. So poetic. Like, oh, the, he's the a English great, know how to he do is it. A, <laughs> yes, and, and specifically Sir, Sir Goddard, he is a great, great talker. He wrote a lot. He wrote a lot about uh, military this story uh, he did not uh, account for publicly until the mid 60s when he wrote an article about it and then he includes it in his book in the mid 70s but he's a big big writer big talker master of language and also very funny um so just that 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 very wonderful english wit is like full in this guy i love him uh, now as he's headed off over there to the Drim airfield uh suddenly Oftentimes you'll read this as like the sky turns yellowish brown. So there's this weird color in the air as he's flying and it's still raining, but it kind of breaks through and becomes very clear suddenly. And this is when Goddard noticed that the Drim airfield was somehow now in perfect condition, whereas the day before it was all torn up and it was farmland. And here I'm going to continue the quote from him uh, in his own words. The hangars were darkly looming towards me, only a quarter of a mile away. Then suddenly the area was bathed in an ethereal light, as though the sun were shining on a midsummer day. As I raced over the airfield, I saw some surprising things. Evidently, as I saw it, the rain had recently stopped. The airfield, all unfenced, was evenly mown. No cattle or sheep were grazing. The tarmac around the hangars was wide and new. The hangars all had sound roofs. The doors of the first hangar were open. And five aircraft, all bright yellow, four of them biplanes, one monoplane, were lined up on the tarmac. Mechanics in blue overalls were pushing out another monoplane. The men below were not interested in me as I sped over them not more than 50 feet above the hangars 
and I flew out of the sunshine into the dark rain and mist again. So to kind of reiterate, sky opens up, it's beautiful, it's sunny, it's wonderful, and the hangars are rebuilt, the runway is rebuilt all from the day before. There's, uh, this is where you do find differences in his own words and what you always read about the case. Normally you read, he saw four planes. He's saying, he saw five, maybe six. So he saw five planes, four are biplanes, one is monoplane, and there may have been a second monoplane in, in the hangar as well. And all the mechanics are wearing blue overalls. And yeah, sorry, were you going to say something? No, it sounds on brand for <laughs> so, mechanics out in the field. Absolutely. So what's interesting about that, though, is that, A, first of all, the storm is suddenly gone. B, everything's rebuilt. The RAF in 1934 did not have any planes painted yellow. Hmm. So that was un uncommon, to say the least. So it's probably an awful color for, like hiding in the gray skies and well what they do <laughs> what they do now and they started to do uh, in the story you'll, you'll hear about is it's training planes that get mm -hmm. painted yellow now and the mechanics in 1934 for the raf wore brown jumpsuits not mm -hmm. blue so there's some weird th also monoplanes there apparently were no monoplanes in the raf at the time so this is all very interesting and very strange and uh, and then the storm comes back. He sort of passes over the airfield. He sees all this and then suddenly poof, back into the storm. He's able to actually climb back to a certain good altitude to kind of keep himself relatively safe, I guess. Safe may not be the right word, but he's able to fly and he continues on back to Andover into England. And that's kind of the end of the story for a while. He does mention that he tried to tell people on the ground about this, like at some other officers, and they thought he was just kooky and weird and maybe drunk or crazy. So he just, in his words, he just stopped telling people about it. Yeah. Is that where the changes in the story come along, where it's sort of the game of telephone that works its way down? Like, you heard those crazy pilots then? I, I don't think that's when it does. I And this is something to consider as well. If you, if you try to deduce or investigate or you're trying to figure out if this really happened either did he make it up or did he experience something and he thinks it's some sort of weird time slip but maybe it wasn't so as you're trying to figure these things out it, it, he did not tell anybody publicly per him anyway until the mid-60s when he wrote about it so mm. that's what 30 years later that he's finally talking about it. So that's something to think about as well, because memory changes oh, and yeah. gets affected with time. You're a new dad. Memory's probably going <laughs> yeah. through a lot of weird things right Absolutely. now with the baby. That definitely happened to me. Regardless of whether he kept quiet or you believe this or not, he starts to later in life believe that he experienced some kind of time travel. He, they didn't use the term time slip at the time, but he thought he may have traveled through time. And the reason is, is that in 1939, he noticed that the RAF, they began to paint their training planes yellow and the mechanics uniforms, because World War II is starting. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of changes, a lot of ramp up in, the, in, in all of this. The uniforms of the mechanics changed blue. Mm -hmm. uh, he also, there was a new training plane called the Magister, and that was a monoplane. And he recognized that as one of the planes, the monoplane he saw on the ground. So he started to suspect that he traveled through time into 1939. And Drim Airfield as well was being ramped up and used again for World War II. Yeah. So that's why he started to make that kind of connection and think about this. And in 1975, he wrote uh, a book called Flight into Reality, which talks about this story. I'll provide links for that. You can find hard copies that are used. I don't think there's like a modern print, but you can definitely find the book out there in many places. And as I mentioned earlier, he was a big writer, so you can find a lot of other books and stories by Sir Victor Goddard. Yeah, or do you have any initial thoughts after hearing the story? Does anything stand out to you? Do, you? do you believe it? Do you not? Do you think it's weird? What's going on in your head? So the first thing that jumped into my head is like I had, had assumed that he went back in time when he goes through, and then you're telling like they didn't have those color planes, and the guys were in different color jumpsuits, and like you said earlier, just being in the car world, like, yeah, everybody, every mechanic wears a blue jumpsuit, but it makes yeah. sense that they were in a different one. Yeah. And just the whole, like, trying to go back and forth, and you're 
describing it, or he's describing the way when he comes out of the clouds and it's like a just different color and he gets like flashes of, what was that movie Memphis Bell oh yeah yeah when they're trying to bring the bomber yeah. home and like yeah. how everything just sort of gets like washed out yep yep it's just all this sort of cinematic stuff going through my head especially because it's a wonderful writer that yes. it's, it's describing it so um and then also like being from Colorado, I live pretty, well, not pretty close, but like an hour from the Air Force Academy mm-hmm. and thinking about all their training planes. They're all gliders. And yeah. so they're completely silent and they sort of waft over the highway when you're headed south past the springs and just sort of this whole confluence of different thoughts running through your head. It's yeah. It's just like getting me excited to see where this goes. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> again, that's why I wanted to do this story because I, I try to find things for a study of strange that aren't the typical stories like that aren't the typical serial killer that isn't you know the, find the, the stories that not everybody can find a million documentaries and everything on this story is rather famous so this mm-hmm. is does this does not fit that but the reason i drifted towards it is a because i want to learn more about some of these strange stories that might deal with time travel and this was a good one because of that because of the 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 descriptions of what he went through and sort of the cinematic essence of it and also him as a person like it's it's just a it's an interesting story with a very interesting person Mm -hmm. and and i do love the idea of time slips more than again like i said earlier more than like time travel stories you read about this idea of like a slip something is just off and our understanding of space and time is so it, it's so infantile, right? Yeah. Like we're learning more about the quantum level all the time where all these new theories are coming out all the time. We're able to take pictures of black holes now yes. and all these things relate together. And I feel like our understanding of time is just so, so basic and, and probably not at all what it really is. So this idea that there could just be just a weird little poof, eh. and also interdimensional, like the alter, alternate realities. This all goes into various theories that people have about stories like this. And so it's just, I can't fully wrap my head around it. So it's a nice, it's a nice little tiptoe in these kind yeah. of stories for me to learn more about it. That being said, I am a natural skeptic. And one of the things that I, I tend to, my brain tends to attach to when I hear stories like this that I think could just be made up because that that's obviously a potential option in this too, <laughs> is inconsistencies in stories. And I have a fascination with how stories change over time, like the game of telephone that you said earlier. And this one doesn't really do that. And there's a few reasons why. One is he didn't start telling it until 30 years later, but also it is, there's a lot of accounts for it. There's a lot of quotes he's written about it. So you can't really, the story doesn't change until people like me, like on podcast, we use our own words to tell the story. And that's where pe- some people might find little yeah. little bits that change over time. But because you can go back to him and it's still so recent, like 1975 isn't that long ago when you think about it, there's there's not a ton of inconsistencies except through podcast and TV shows and stuff mm-hmm. <laughs> like that. Well, everybody's got to take their angle on the story. Yes, yeah. e- exactly. And so there's there's few inconsistencies. So that kind of makes me line up with okay, there's there's something to this story. Um, you got to look at motivations. Was he trying to make money? He was. He's he's a writer. He was selling books and stuff like that. And also, as I get into in his biography, he was doing other things in the paranormal and. Uh, world and UFO world like he was very much into that so he there could have been some motivation to sell copies of things Mm -hmm. Um, but he is a very he's a very intelligent guy and highly highly decorated military veteran and highly respected so I don't think he's somebody that just wants to bullshit to sell a copy so there's there's those are all like the contradictory things that bounce around in my head. Yeah, I you live in the corporate world long enough, and you sort of just, just, money seems to be always the thing behind it. But mm-hmm. if he's like you said, he's a knight, he's retired Air Force, like money probably isn't an issue for this guy, right? No, I don't think so. Not that he was wealthy or any by any means, but like I don't think he was ever hard off or anything. Um, yeah, so let's get into his biography a little bit just to understand him a little bit better. So he was born in 1897. He passed away in 87, so he lived to be 90 um, or thereabouts. He started his career in the military during the First World War. I believe he started with the Navy, but kind of quickly jumped over to the air services. Uh, and he was very active. He patrolled in, in for U-boats and dirigibles. And he apparently, at least 
<laughs> he says this, <laughs> uh, came up with the term blimp for certain types of airships. Okay. And that's actually where our first scene is going to come in, Scott. <laughs> so we're going to do one scene today. Um, and this is a, a, this is such a dorky scene. I'm already slightly <laughs> embarrassed and now I have to do it because I called it out. Um, so this is a dramatization of, a, of allegedly how the term blimp started to be used for airships. And there is a difference between a blimp and a, is it just dirigible? I'm going to sound like an idiot. What is the other? A dirigible airship, uh, zeppelins. Ze- yeah. So uh, there's, there's the hard body and blimps are not that blimps are, are okay. fully inflated. I'll read the the descriptions and I'm going to read um, uh, Cunningham and you'll read Goddard. Uh, you ready for it? You want to dive into it? You ready to go? Just trying to read ahead a little bit. You want me to try a terrible British accent or not? Uh, o- only if you want to. You definitely do not have to by any means. <laughs> hey, you give four or five pints to me. I can do it in Scottish. That's I don't know tr- if I can true. do English. <laughs> it is very early in the morning, so I don't know if you want a bunch of pints uh, <laughs> yet. In RAF airfield during the day... In the 19 teens of some kind, I didn't write down exactly what you were using. Lieutenant Cunningham, a very British gentleman, is at the airfield to examine airships. He's walking around the ground in hangars accompanied by midshipman at the time, Victor Goddard. And this here, sir, is a submarine scout pressure airship. Ah, brilliant. What's this bit here, then? That's called the gas bag. <laughs> that was my nickname in school. <laughs> Get it? Gas bag? Ah, <laughs> yes. Cunningham leans towards the gas bag and flicks it with his thumb and makes a strange noise that echoes. Cunningham laughs <laughs> and flicks it again. Boing! Blimp! <laughs> Cunningham looks to Goddard, expecting Goddard to be laughing, but he's just weirded out. Interior of the mess hall later on, Goddard is surrounded by his mates, eating dinner, regaling them about his tour with Cunningham. And then he flicks the gas bag and it makes this blimp sound with his mouth. The men laugh. <laughs> uh, when does the scout fly next? Don't you mean when does the blimp fly next? Haha, <laughs> 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 that's what we should call it from now on. Huzzah! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just love doing a uh, very pompous uh, British laugh. <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, so that is the that is the story of how the term blimp came about. Victor Goddard regaled his his friends and fellow officers in the mess hall later after this uh <laughs> lieutenant cunningham flicked the gas bag of a of a blimp and it made a blimp sound and that is where we get the term again allegedly allegedly get the term blimp uh that is not the only term that goddard came up with allegedly we'll get to to that a little later on is this true it it may not be <laughs> <laughs> but hey, there you go. There's other people that say, or other things I've read. I shouldn't say people. Although I know people are behind the writing I read, but I don't know who they are. <laughs> but the there's some descriptions that say that there was a type of World War One British airship called the Balloon Type B Limp. And you combine Type B and Limp and you make Blimp. Um, but yeah, there's just a lot of... No one actually knows for sure. <laughs> If any listeners out there know the real story behind the term blimp, um, give me give me a shout. A study of strange at gmail.com. I'd love to to hear some some confirmation in any of those things. <laughs> now, after the First World War, Sir Victor uh, studied for a while and then became an instructor. He commanded a bomber squadron in Iraq in 1929, and he was also involved in intelligence for the air ministry. And according to his obituary, he was part of a counter espionage mission mission in the 1930s where he he fed disinformation to the Germans and it helped the UK get a leg up on their bomber designs for World War Two. So this guy's doing a lot yeah. like this guy is, a, again, fascinating, amazing career and life that Victor Goddard had. Now, most interesting to me is Goddard may well have been the one to come up with the idea that saved hundreds of thousands of British soldiers at Dunkirk. Really? Yes, following uh, the beginning of World War II. So Dunkirk, I mean, there was a recent Christopher Nolan movie, so that's how a lot of younger people may know about it. Um, But yeah, a lot of British soldiers are basically trapped in the north of France, uh, in the Dunkirk area on the beach. The British cannot send enough uh, battleships to save them. And uh, the the a lot of 
British citizens got in their boats and, and drove went across over, the channel, went across the channel and saved hundreds of thousands of British soldiers lives. This is also where the famous Churchill speech comes out of this experience. Now, Goddard, the story goes that he flew in a seatless plane at night from France into England. He had to make sure he wasn't shot down flying over England. So he had to be very careful on like land mm. at the right time and all that kind of stuff. And he found his way to uh, basically talking his way into a joint chiefs meeting. And he told him that, hey, we've got to evacuate like 200 plus thousand soldiers stat and the military were like, we don't have enough destroyers to save them all. Oh, dear. And Goddard suggested sending an armada of small boats. And then he was kicked out of the room because that's <laughs> ridiculous. And then they basically did just and they that. Did that. Uh, now, again, I can't I don't know if that's true or not, but I I do kind of believe it. Like this is a well-respected military person. There's other people there that are alive when he's telling people the story that he did this. Mm -hmm. So I don't. I don't actually doubt that that's true. I think he was probably had something to do with figuring out a plan to save these soldiers. So it's it's really fascinating. That whole episode's fascinating. The, the whole Dunkirk story. You know, yeah, you'll hear stuff from the British British sides, from the German side. Mm -hmm. Like if you're ever interested in a deep dive, that one's. Yeah, it, it is. It is worth it for people that are uh, sort of fans of that type of history and reading and stuff. It is. It's an amazing story, and I definitely need to read more about it myself. Um, and check out the Christopher Nolan movie. I actually really enjoyed it, even though it uh, wasn't everybody's favorite, right? Yeah, I only made it through about the first 15 <laughs> or 20 minutes. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, ar around this time, Victor Goddard became friends with a philosopher named E.W. Fawcett, a British ph philosopher whose theories I did. I actually had trouble trying to read more about him because I went on a little bit of a deep dive or trying to find more about E.W. Fawcett. And... There's just a lot more reading I have to do to be able to explain <laughs> him. But he, he had these kind of far out ideas about how the universe works. And in my own words, and I'm going to butcher his philosophy, but essentially he 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 thought in uh, the sort of the, the imagination, the power of the mind was more important or more believable than kind of normal science, quote unquote. And there's probably philosophers or people that have read about Fawcett out there listening to this being like, what the hell are you talking about? That's completely <laughs> wrong. But that's just kind of my interpretation from the little bit I've read. And But he had a, a big influence on Sir Victor Goddard's life. And in my own opinion, I think he unintentionally kind of pointed Goddard into a larger fascination with the unexplained or paranormal that I think Goddard probably originally was was like. Um, so I, I think that relationship between the two of them is an important one in Goddard's life. The real opening your third eye kind of thing. I think so. Yeah. I think I really think that he was influenced by him. Uh, Goddard loved the paranormal. He loved the unexplained. He loved stories like this. Yeah, same. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, me too. Anything unexplained, I'm there. And he loved writing and theorizing about the world and these strange things. And... Yeah, so he also became a spiritualist after Fawcett died. Fawcett died, I think, in 1960, right around there. I didn't write down the exact year. Um, but after he died, Goddard wanted to be able to communicate with him. And they had apparently talked about this before Fawcett died. So Goddard became a spiritualist, which it, the definition of that is someone that believes that they can communicate with the dead. Yeah, yeah. So so Goddard's really getting into the, the world uh, <laughs> like that. Um, and so this later era of Goddard's life, because he retired from the military in the 50s, I believe 51. So kind of like the second half, the second phase of Goddard's life. He was very military focused at first. And now he's getting into this. Um, Drifts into the spiritual holistic, no, not holistic, but like spiritual world. This, yeah, the spiritual world is a good way to say it. One of the tales of paranormal that comes from Goddard that I think I probably, this is how I knew his name before the time slip story is there's a famous photograph that Goddard took of his air squadron in 1919. And it allegedly shows the ghost of a man that had just died that day, standing right behind a guy in the back row of the photo. And the ghost's name was Freddie Jackson. And that is Victor God. So if you've ever watched a TV show about ghost photos or a YouTube video or gone on a website that lists like 
famous ghost photos. This is one of them. Like, this is on one there, of the yeah. most famous ones. <laughs> and that is a photo that Goddard took. Um, so he's instantaneously, not instantaneously, but at, at this moment in his life, he ties himself to the world of the paranormal with that photo. Um, there's also a famous story um, where, which is a more famous kind of uh, strange story of Goddard than even the time slip one, where in 1946, he was in Shanghai. He was at a, a, a party and a fellow officer mentioned that he had a dream that Goddard died in a plane crash, basically crashing into like a rocky cliff or beach or something like that. And Goddard was supposed to fly to, I think, Japan that night. And he ended up getting into a, a big crash that was very similar to this dream. But he survived. There's the key difference. Yeah. <laughs> in the dream he died. In real life, he survived. And now a movie based on this experience was made in 1955. It also inspired a Twilight Zone episode. So that is what Goddard kind of became very famous for in the mid-century is that story. Um, of so this. he's out there. He's... Like yeah in the community of uh yes paranormal and he, spiritual yes. folks a indeed and there's even another story i didn't write this one down um but he he had another experience i think earlier in his life where he had a dream and sort of like foresaw uh i think world war one is what it was he like hmm. saw a cloud that looked like europe and it was being taken over and so he foresaw this major world war hmm. and thinks that he was seeing into the future getting a sign of, of what is to become so yes he is very much in that world he also believed in ufos and he would go to meetings and conferences later in life he would give talks about ufos and i, I wrote down a quote this is one of his most famous quotes you see it on a lot of different articles written about him uh where he gave a speech about ufos and i found this speech fascinating because I'm not smart enough to understand it. Uh, do you want to okay. read it? It actually might be fun for you to read it. You want to give it a go? Sure. So it's the highlighted green All thing right. there. All right. Is there a... yeah. <clears throat> All right. Given that real UFOs are paraphysical, capable of reflecting light like ghosts, and given also that they remain visible as they change position at ultra high speeds from one point to another, it follows that those that remain visible in transition do not dematerialize for that swift transition, and therefore their mass must be made of a. I got nothing for it. Di <laughs> you can skip it. Danifer's nature. <laughs> uh, the observed uh, the observed validity of this supports the paraphysical assertion, and makes the likelihood of UFO being Earth created greater than the likelihood of their creation on another planet. The astral world of illusion, which on physical evidence, is greatly inhabited. Jesus, that's not a word. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. a reason why I had you read this. <laughs> is greatly inhabited by illusion-prone spirits. Is well known for its multifarious imaginative activities. Oh the, God! Is the it man worth? knew how to use a thesaurus. Yes, he did. He, like I said, very good talker, very good writer. But it, again, was I had, he trying to explain like just the fact that UFOs can go from in the air to the water and? I think so, and also, and also could potentially be sort of earth created yeah because there's theory out there about well, ufos that can move between water and through earth mm -hmm. and through the air and they never slow down or lose momentum or anything and that has to prove that they were made here because we wouldn't have this whatever planet they're from wouldn't have the same viscosity or um mm -hmm. acceleration due to gravity or anything like that and you get into the physics but if he's yeah. already on that in the was that the 40s 30s this is i think he said this in the 70s oh, okay. um at one of the talks he was at and i apologize i should have actually written that down um i, I it, the way i take notes is i'm like i'll remember that was in 1975 <laughs> oh, and yeah. then i totally don't <laughs> um but i believe this is in the 70s later on when when he was kind of more involved with that world but no he had a lot of he had a lot of theories and i'm sure they changed throughout his life like they do for all of us about all things paranormal and unexplained, including UFOs and time travel. And obviously his experiences and his life affected his beliefs in these things. But it's in my point with that is that he he is thinking about this stuff, I think, a little ahead of his time, especially mm -hmm. when you specifically if we we focus in on the time slip story where he's talking about things in a way that wasn't just like, hey, it's an alien, yeah. which most people were in the 1970s. And with the time slip thing, if people talk about time travel back then, it wasn't as sort of popularized as it is now. 
but they would have been more like hg wells like it would have been mm-hmm. a little more old school but this like slip in time is kind of ahead of its time when you think about the way that we think about space and time nowadays yeah when was Crichton writing about that because he did a book uh, um, i think in the he did was the, it the 70s or 80s he was doing i, I think, think it was the 80s are you talking okay. about when they go back in time to the medieval time yeah yeah yeah, yeah. which made a really terrible movie it's a great book, though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, no, it, I'm forgetting the name of it, but it's good. Yeah, it is good. And in the... God, when was... Is it... Timeline, that's what it's called. Timeline, there we go. Yeah. Um, no, so it would have been kind of more old school, but he's he's a bit ahead of his time with the way that he's not only experiencing things, but the way he's trying to understand them. Mm-hmm. And that... Yeah, that just makes me like this guy even more. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my question just opposed to myself and to the world and to you is you have this decorated veteran you have this highly intelligent individual that's thinking about things in in kind of new ways is how what do we believe i guess with his experience with this time slip in 1934 do you have any uh any new thoughts especially after learning more about it well yeah the whole like what do we believe especially nowadays with all the different arguments of science versus what you believe mm-hmm. it opens a whole other can of worms. I'm more inclined to believe the guy that is if having to read what he spoke out loud. He seems like a very smart, smart guy. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, like if you just throw enough big words together. You can make everybody seem like <laughs> anybody seem like they're smart. Um, and at, I don't know if smart is what you're looking for when you're like you i'd rather somebody's believable than smart yeah um and the way he describes coming through the bursting through the clouds into like i said like sepia toned beautiful like idyllic landing strip and all that sort of stuff it i don't know it seems like it could be something that he's misremembering but also like if that matches and the yeah the model of plane matches then then yeah it absolutely could be true yeah, and none of this, when you're trying to figure out if these things are real or not, I, I believe he believed it. Mm-hmm. And and that's a big difference with someone who you're like, you're just making that up to make it up. Yeah. Like, I really do believe that he believed this. And you do have to take into account uh, sort of that confirmation bias that we can all have with our beliefs where he could have experienced something that has a... a a, a definitive earthly explanation but because of his confirmation bias he's creating something out of it and in terms of that i actually do want to share a few thoughts about real quote unquote real <laughs> potential explanations for what he did Drim, he dec- he described when he flew over it as being this completely like farm-like land and wasn't in use where you can actually look up the history of Jim airfield online and you can find out that in 1933 they began to use it again. Not the RAF, but it was used for civil planes. And civil planes aren't going to necessarily be painted the same color as yeah. Royal Air Force. They're, they could be bright colored. Yeah, go to any airport. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so DRIM was in use. It was not completely vacated. And so this would have been a year after they started using DRIM again. And He also could have been lost. He just was in this major storm, if that's real. He could have popped out somewhere that he didn't think. Something I read, uh, this article I read online, someone theorized that it could have been the Rinfew Aerodrome, which is was the home for the Scottish Flying Club in 1934, which would have again had brightly painted planes, both biplanes and monoplanes. Mm Um, so that could have been why he he was seeing those kind of things, yeah. and also the the wrong color mechanic outfits. Because if it's not the the Royal Air Force, people can wear whatever they want. Might have seen some people yeah. in blue. And if you're out in an airfield, the, a lot of times the color you're wearing is your job, and it, maybe they weren't mechanics. Maybe they were like landing strip guys or something. A- absolutely. And uh, he also thought he saw Miles Magister monoplane which he said later on in life when he started telling the story, didn't come out until 1939. That's actually not true. It had been around (laughs) since 33, the year before. And there were also other monoplanes that he could have mistaken it for at the time. And if it wasn't military, it might have been painted yellow. Yeah. So I'm not saying these are in fact what happened. I'm just saying these could be the explanation for what's going on. 
Uh, and also time. He's not really sharing the story for 30 years. Mm-hmm. Time changes your your memory. It happens to all of us, no matter what we say. Um, so he could be literally just misremembering something he saw. And yeah, the dead reckoning navigation thing is what's getting to me the most. Yeah, um, yeah. That product of the American public school system. They didn't teach me how credit works, but I took an aviation <laughs> class in high school. And you run through how to how to put out a flight path and how to chart it and all the navigation tools. And this is in the nineties. So there's, it's even in the nineties, it's almost all done by computer, but Mm. they teach us on stuff from the seventies and eighties. And that's, yeah, there's your, yeah. Well, it's important to know that I would assume all pilots have to learn that, learn how to navigate with dead reckoning and with basically every type of potential option of navigation, because what if something fails? Like I would imagine that they do train everybody in those kind of things now today. Um, and also I have an account for the ghost story just because I love, I love stuff like this <laughs> where you, you find like, this is the story that everybody knows and then you find something actually different. So I wanted to share this, even though it doesn't have to do with the time slip story. So the famous ghost picture that he has that you see on every ghost documentary show, cause I watch those. <laughs> uh, I see it all the time. I've been seeing it for years. The story of the dead soldier that died that very day that is in the picture. Turns out he didn't die that day. <laughs> Uh, he was in a crash at that airfield, but he was whisked away to a hospital, died later, many, 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 many miles away, not right there, did not die right at that time. Um, and so that just does that does show how our beliefs and that confirmation bias, because he remembers Goddard would have remembered that guy crashing. Yeah, he remembered you know, he died. He didn't yeah. know when. He died. He died right mm-hmm. there. So he showed up in the picture that day. And it's like, no, he he actually didn't. Um Plus, so, I can't imagine the definition on the photograph was great. And no, well, that's the thing. To is, find a bunch of white guys in the forties yeah. on an airfield. <laughs> white guys, forties an airfield. He is. What's interesting about it that does make you kind of go like, "Ooh, that is spooky." Is uh, the person is not wearing a hat where everybody else is in the picture is wearing a hat because it's likely this is just double exposure. Okay. Think about film the way cameras work. It's not like today. You got to have time for the light to affect the chemicals on the film. I took that class in high school too. Yeah, yeah. 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 And again, nothing on credit or finance or anything. No, no, no. Again, you got to. Yeah, that's not <laughs> photography. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't worry about that stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's likely it's double exposure. And one of the theories that I've read about this photo is that it could have been literally the gentleman in the back row, right in front of the quote unquote ghost. And he could have been taking off his hat or, oh, my God, I got to put my hat on, Mm -hmm. like, as they're taking the photo. So that little movement created the ghostly image. And that's why all old photographs, when it comes to ghosts, it's like it's just 90 percent of the time. It's just double exposure or something got into the frame. And I, I believe that with that picture as well. So, again, I don't think Goddard lied about his time slip. I do think we have to question whether he really experienced it. Um, that's my skeptical brain. I, my theory is he saw something and he's misremembering or he saw a different airfield or there were people using the airfield and it wasn't quite as in shambles as the day before when he says, and I think he's flown through two world wars. So he's probably seen quite a bit of action and some awful stuff, probably concussed in the air (laughs) or any sort of anti-aircraft fire coming at him. Yeah. Absolutely could misremember stuff. I think he's misremembering stuff. That That's just me. But I do believe he believed it. And I do think there is something for somebody that doesn't believe in, in hooey, bluey, whatever <laughs> stuff um, that just loves the stories of him. I actually do think time slip is an interesting. It is an interesting anomaly. Uh, there are many other stories. Again, this is just this episode, ladies and gentlemen, is kind of just for me to dip my toes into this. It, I, this is totally like a personal episode where it's like, I just want to learn more about this. And this is a way for me to start to do it because uh, there are many other time slip stories and they're all absolutely fascinating and in a weird way, more believable than so many other strange stories. Uh, so I want to learn more about it. If anybody out there has stories of time slips that they think I should look at, look into, whether it be for the show or just for my own education, email me a study of strange at gmail.com. Let me know. I've read a few already about uh, people in Liverpool, like seeing a, you know, a shopping truck that's from a different time and 
there was someone in front of them that was also from the modern age and they both experienced it at the same time. I've heard stories of people in England driving down the highway and suddenly there's like 1940s military aircraft flying overhead and then the military aircraft just disappear. Mm. And there's actually a number of old military, like aircraft. And that's one of the fascinating things about this time slip story too, because it's one of the first ones, but people in the 70s and 80s and 90s have these experiences with like World War II airplanes that are really, time slips flying stories. overhead so the, yeah there's something interesting about time slips and old airplanes maybe that's just people seeing an old aircraft yeah, flying because that collector airplanes still, yeah. out there yeah uh living in la i actually see old aircraft all the time flying overhead because there's various bases and airports around but there's also uh, plenty of other stories that are all very odd and what i like about them is they're quick Mm -hmm. And that makes them to me a little bit more believable because it's not like I lived in 1972 for five months when it was actually 2015. There's not a lot of time to make stuff up. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's like, no, it's it's a brief glance through time and space. And uh, it, it's, yeah, I'm just thoroughly intrigued, even though I do not understand it yet. <laughs> so hopefully I will have follow up episodes. Again, email me ideas, things I should look into for this, and I will definitely check it out let me know your thoughts on sir victor goddard's story as well and yeah any any final thoughts on this scott no i've I ran through the gamut do this yeah. i was yeah i'm on this guy's side and then i'm thinking about this <laughs> and I'm like well yeah is it a time slip or is it like a memory slip at this point point? Mm -hmm. so yeah i will be going and doing a little bit more homework myself so. yeah absolutely and i think everybody should it is it's a it's a really cool story and check out victor's book as well i'll again i'll put links to find old copies of it uh, in my show notes so check that out so uh do you want people to find you are you on the social media do you want to to do any of that kind of stuff i am i'm not terribly interesting i mostly take <laughs> pictures of my kid and <laughs> nature because live in colorado it's absolutely gorgeous yeah yeah um yeah, i don't know I, instagram at rugger gordo so rugby ex, ex rugby player um yeah if anything go visit denverwaterdogsrugby.com there you, you just go click around on there help us get some numbers yeah rugby ladies and <laughs> gentlemen rugby check it out uh i i'm definitely physically perfect for rugby <laughs> and my my small non-muscular build i think i would do very well i'd get hit very hit over very very easily uh, <laughs> uh well thank you scott for doing this my pleasure and uh hopefully i've left you thinking about time and time travel in some fashion mm -hmm. That'll do it for the show. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you to Scott Smith for joining me. If you want to know more about Sir Victor Goddard's experiences with a paranormal or time slip story, there are uh, great resources on this topic. Uh, and just for time's sake, we really couldn't go into all of it, which is always disappointing, but that's the nature of the beast. So I will provide links to all the good ones I can think of. I'm sure there's more out there. And I am very sincere, like I said in the show, if you know of a good time slip story that I should check out either for the show or just for myself, for my own, edu my own education, send me an email at astudyofstrange at gmail.com. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at astudyofstrange. Check out our Patreon and everything else on our website, astudyofstrange.com. And please subscribe, rate, and review next week. We will be talking about another strange phenomenon with filmmaker Laura Moss, who is premiering a movie, Birth Rebirth, at Sundance in just about a week from uh, this recording right here. So check that out. Very excited about it. I think that does it. Thank you all again, and good night. <laughs>